Today I want to talk about Wittgenstein and Fred Thomas. So first of all, a little bit about Ludwig Wittgenstein himself. Wittgenstein was a very peculiar sort of person. Um, he studied with Russell and Moore at Cambridge. Uh, the Tractatus was his dissertation, so it would be fascinating to have been there at the dissertation defense to hear the three of them discussing these ideas. Uh, Wittgenstein himself was enormously wealthy, um, born to one of the wealthiest families in Vienna uh, and in all of Aust Austria Hungary. Um, he ended up serving in the First World War in the Austrian army, um, which is part of the reason in the lectures. Uh, that Russell says, I don't know whether he's alive or dead. Wittgenstein was a sort of curious person. He had no interest in wealth and ended up giving away the family fortune. Um, he, for many years, taught at a small elementary school in the mountains uh, in Austria uh, because he went to Cambridge and uh, decided that philosophy was pointless, essentially, <laughs> and so did this. Um, it is reported that his elementary school students were terrified of him, <laughs> that he routinely slapped people who got wrong answers out of the thing. In any event, he ended up going back to Cambridge eventually. Um, there is a famous incident, much disputed, in which Karl Popper appeared and gave a talk in Cambridge, and uh, Wittgenstein is said to have threatened him with a fireplace poker. Uh, there is an entire book about that called Wittgenstein's Poker. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's clear that he was waving the poker around. Uh, witnesses differ about whether this was threatening or whether. But in any case, they were discussing ethical propositions and auth statements. And Wittgenstein was waving this poker about at Popper, saying, give me one example of <laughs> a rationally justified auth statement. And he said, you ought not threaten visiting speakers with fireplace pokers. <laughs> at which point, Wittgenstein stormed, stormed out of the room. Uh, Anyway, he was a highly idiosyncratic guy. He wrote this. It was published in 1921, although it was written some years uh, before that presumably he was actually serving in the war, uh, or at least it was started then. Um, then for a long time, he didn't really do very much or publish very much, and then he wrote the Philosophical Investigations and a variety of other things that appeared in the late 50s, and um, those had a huge impact and were a radical departure from the thought here. But here, Russell at least thinks that Wittgenstein and here are on the same page, that Wittgenstein is in part the person who inspired his logical atomism. As we'll see, Wittgenstein um, conceived of things rather differently and actually did not think he and Russell were on the same page at all. Um, and in fact, there's a very nice book about Wittgenstein called Wittgenstein's Vienna, which argues that he really ought to be understood as a continental philosopher, not as an analytic philosopher, and that he's up to something radically different from what Russell and others thought he was up to. Apparently, at one point, even though his work helped to inspire the Vienna Circle, he was asked by Vienna Circle philosophers to appear before them and give a talk. And I'm told that he came to the meeting of the Vienna Circle, turned his back to them, and read poetry aloud to them, rather than actually give them a philosophical talk, something that mystified them. In any event, let's start with the beginning of the track times. Uh, I took a seminar, by the way, senior year, last semester, that was entirely on the Tractatus, and <laughs> we all hated it. The seminar, that is, the Tractatus. Um, it, was, it was a few people in my class had taken a, a course at the University of Pennsylvania with a sociologist named Philip Reef. And Reef's style was to go sentence by sentence very slowly, that, so that in his seminars, which met just once a week for two and a half hours, you would get through maybe one sentence. Um, in two and a half hours. And so you would be lucky by the end of the semester to get through the first page. Anyway, <laughs> they said, ah, we want that kind of course on the track tops. And so that's what happened. Um, I actually thought this was brutal. And the result was that we had a, it was like see, seeing a very, a series of very close up images of someone and never seeing the whole picture of their face. Imagine that somebody says, all right, I'm going to do a portrait. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to zoom in with an electron microscope and get one of your hairs, right? <laughs> and so on and so forth. But I think, I have no idea what this guy looks like. All I see are these little, you know, microscopic images, and that's what that course was like. Well, today my strategy is just the opposite of that, to give you the big picture, and we're going to skip over a number of important details just so that we can get the big image and see the picture of it. So let's start. The world is all that is the case. 
Now what he does here is give you an elaborate outline, right? This is proposition one. In the end, there are seven propositions here. And if you want a sort of short, <laughs> Short version of the Tractatus, just read the seven main propositions, and they give you the structure of the entire work. But then you get 1.1, and then various things under that, 1.1.1, or 1.11, 1.12, you know, et cetera, that explain those. But it's all an elaborate outline, and really it would be nicer, although it would be obnoxious and take up a lot of paper, but it would be nice if these were indented so that it was easy to see. Just what, depending on what, yeah. So is this that was on canvas your own distillation of what's in that book? Um, it's not my own distillation. It's actually excerpts, but I have put in some of that indentation in the original oh, that's see. not there. So I've tried to help you out so you can see that outline structure. Um, as it's usually presented, it's just a list like that. And then it's very easy to miss what is actually a key proposition and what's explaining what. So I've tried visually to, to sort of help out. But OK. The world, the first bit of explanation, 1.1, the world is the totality of facts, not of things. Now, we have a nice contrast going on. If we're thinking about what makes up the world, <laughs> and we're doing what Russell did, starting to think about the ultimate constituents, we've got a question of, well, what are we looking for as the ultimate constituents? Let's think about, oh, well, for example, Plato. What are the ultimate constituents of the world in Plato? The forms. the forms. The forms, really, right? I mean, think about the divided line. You've got shadows of things, but they're really derivative, right, of the objects. But then that whole visible realm is really derivative of the realm of forms. And then the mathematical forms are actually derivative from the most abstract forms. And so you might say, look, we've really got shadows of shadows and so on. And in the end, it's the forms that are really the ultimate constituents of the world. How about Aristotle? What are the ultimate constituents of the world for Aristotle? Forms in matter. OK, forms in matter. And what is a form in a matter? Forms and matter. <laughs> forms and matter. Yeah. Right, exactly. So we've got this hylomorphic conception, as it's called, a question of form and matter. But now it's not sort of understood as two big realms, the realm of the material and the realm of the forms, but instead informed matter, right? And so this piece of chalk might be an example of the form of a piece of chalk in a bit of matter, um, or me, humanity, the form of humanity in, well, flesh and bone. Um, and so in those cases, we say, aha, with me, this particular bit of informed matter, or this as a bit of informed matter, those are substances, right? And so we can think in terms of, ah, yes, there are all these categories, but they all depend on substance. Or we can think, well, what is a substance? It's really a form in matter. And so we've got substances from one point of view, or uh, informed matter, uh, matter informed together as in, in, in the basic picture. Well, in Russell's case, what does he think the ultimate constituents are? Simples. They're the ultimate simples out of which everything else is built. And what are those ultimate simples in the end? Senses. Yeah, sense data. These little bits of experience, right? The atom atomistic bits of experience. Now, in Wittgenstein, it's clear the world's all that is the case. The world's the totality of facts, not things. So for Wittgenstein, the ultimate constituents here are really facts. Now, Ultimate? Well, maybe that's unfair, because as we'll see, facts actually are made up of things too. <laughs> and so this is maybe less radical than at first glance, it appears. But it looks like he's trying to say, look, I, I'm differentiating my view from that of Plato or Aristotle or the idealists or Russell or anybody else. I'm saying facts are basic. Facts are the things that make up the world. Now, the world is determined by the facts, and there being all the facts. So notice there is something important here that Russell also observes in the philosophy of logical atoms. It's not enough to just list the facts. You might think, aha, if the world consists of facts, then I could characterize the world completely by just listing all the facts. Let's just take the world consisting of this room, okay, a little subworld, a situation, if you will. And think about what it would be like to characterize it in terms of listing all the facts. It would be complicated. There are a lot of facts just involved in this room. Um, facts about what is where, about who is here, about that poster on the side, about the blackboard and what I've written on it. We'd, if we started listing them, we'd realize, wow, there are really a lot of facts involved in describing just this room. But now, 
suppose we had a list of all those facts. We said, oh, done, we've given a complete description of the room. Wittgenstein is saying, well, not quite. We need to know that those were all the facts. There's an important point here, which is, really, there is a kind of generality that is inelimitable. You can't get rid of it. You've got to say, and that's all, folks. <laughs> Think about an inductive definition where you say, here are the base cases, like, for example, 0 is a number. And then here are the inductive clauses, like if n is a number, then n plus 1 is a number. And then at some point you have to say, and that's all the numbers there are, okay, uh, in order to get a principle of mathematical induction and describe arithmetic. And the same thing is true with all sorts of other things. Um, Aristotle gives you a definition of a citizen. A citizen is the child of a citizen. And you might think, well, that's stupidly circular. <laughs> but it's not really circular. It's that there's some base case he has in mind. OK, these people are citizens. And then how do you get to be a citizen if you're not one of those? Well, you are a child of a citizen. And so that's how he characterizes citizenship in Athens. Now, um, this is, but the point is, you have to at some point say, oh, and, and that's all. That's all the citizens. You need something like here saying, and this is all the facts. So we've got a sort of picture here of that. Um, one way to see this, a practical way to see it, is actually uh, something that's come out in artificial intelligence. Suppose, ah, I don't have to say suppose, real life case. Um, someone who was supposed to give a talk this afternoon can't get here, give the talk, it's canceled. Um, why? Because she's stuck up in the Northeast and there's a snowstorm and her flight was canceled. So one thing you could do is say, oh, is there any way to get to Austin now that my flight has been canceled? You look at the airline schedules and they list flights, right? And their status, let's say, whether there's still any seats on the flight, whether it's been canceled due to the storm. And you could go through and think, well, okay. Now, suppose you can't find a flight with any seats left that's actually flying today. You conclude there is no flight. Now, there could be, those facts that are listed in the table do not actually tell you there are no other flights, but you assume there are no other flights. Uh, yeah? So, is there a difference between there, like, uh, is there a difference between there being no flight and there being flights that aren't flying, that aren't available? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, is that, like, when you say there is no flight, do you mean, like, they're gone? They don't exist right now, the flights. Well, what I really mean to say, yeah, maybe the storm is misleading in this respect. So let me give you a different example. Um, a few years ago, my aunt died. And I was going to go to Pittsburgh for a memorial service, but I was told, no, she didn't want a memorial service. Uh, there is no memorial service. Then I get home on Thursday to listen to a message that says, actually, we are having a memorial service. It'll be Saturday morning. Well, at this point, I look at the flight schedules to say, is it possible for me to get a flight from Austin to Pittsburgh on Friday? And I look at them, and they're all sold out. Now, I infer there is no flight that I can take from Austin to Pittsburgh, right? But in fact, it didn't say there are no flights. It said, well, there were flights A, B, C, and D, but they're all sold out. <laughs> now, I infer, basically, I'm assuming that those are all the facts, that when I look at the Southwest Airlines schedule, for example, it's listing all the flights. It could be that, like, it's not, right? It could be like, oh, here are flight times. But there are these other secret flights. You've got to know somebody, right? But it's not, we, we tend to think, no, no, no. We look at the schedule. There aren't secret flights. Um, if it's not listed there, it doesn't exist, OK? And so it, to go back to the example today, some of those flights well, would exist in general, but aren't existing today because of the storm. But in any case, we look through, and if there's no way to get here, we say, all right, that doesn't do it, that doesn't do it, that doesn't do it for whatever reason. And we end up concluding there's no way to do it. And that's a, the assumption in the background is that the schedule is listing all the flights. Um, you might think, actually, we get into a Devil Wears Prada thing here. You know, get me out of Miami, I've got to get there. Uh, no, that nobody's flying. Even, you know, charter jets might not be flying. And so the thought is, we have to know not only what the facts are, but that those are all the facts. We need something that says, and that's a complete description. And that kind of general fact, that's all the facts, is an important additional fact. Otherwise, we'd never be able to say there isn't anything. It's something related to a problem that the uh, Nyaya Vaisheshika problem uh, philosophers in India worry about. 
Uh, their example is the elephant in the room. Is there an elephant in this room? No. no. Now, how do you know that? Because you don't see an elephant in the room, right? You look around, no elephant, no elephant, no elephant, no elephant, and you conclude there is no elephant in the room. But their point is, well, gosh, how do you do that, right? Uh, you somehow infer from the fact that, okay, over here I just see a door and so on, there's no elephant. Here I see people, there's no elephant here. Somehow you say, and, you know, <laughs> well, what do you see? They, some of them end up saying, there must be a lack of an elephant, an absence. You see there is no elephant, and so there must be a negative fact in Russell or Wittgenstein's term, the, the fact that there is no elephant, or as they would put it, the absence of an elephant in the room. Um, and so they commit themselves to well, negative facts in this terminology, or absences in a more ontological sense. But other people might say, well, no, 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 I, there isn't a separate fact of an elephant not being in the room. They're just the facts that I'm observing in this case, plus this background assumption that those are all the facts, right? That I'm seeing what's in the room. And if there were an elephant here, I would be seeing it. I'm not seeing it, therefore there is no elephant. Okay, anyway, let's continue. The totality of facts determines what is the case and also whatever is not the case. The world divides into facts. And so it's possible for us to take the world and say, well, what are the what's in the world? We can carve it up into these facts. And let's, uh, here, this is important. Each item can be the case or not the case, while everything else remains the same. So it's not just that the facts exist. These facts, the ultimate constituents anyway, which we'll end up calling atomic facts, are logically independent of one another. One of them could change, and everything else would remain the same. Now, if you stop and think about it, you realize, oh, a lot of facts actually aren't like that. Suppose one of you didn't come today. What difference would it have, it, would it have made to any of the rest of us? Are there other facts that would have depended on that? We have perfect attendance here today? No. <laughs> no, that is true. Well, all right. There are a few people absent. What if those few people had shown up? That would have been the addition of a fact that that person is here, right? Would that have added any additional facts? We have empty seats. Or we have a limited amount of empty seats. Oh, all right. We would have had fewer empty seats. Uh, right now, the seat to the right of you is empty. But maybe the person would have sat there, and so there would have been somebody to the right of you. That fact would have been different. Yeah. Uh, there may be more men than women, or women than men, or there may be more brown haired people than. I mean, I mean. Oh, good. Okay. It could change the balance between men and women, or brown haired people and blonde people, or and bald people, or. Uh, gosh. Um, people with blue eyes, green eyes, brown eyes, etc. All sorts of things might change, right? All those numerical counting facts about people in any dimension could have changed. Can you think of other facts that might have changed? Yeah. I mean, the seat would be depressed a little bit because they'd be sitting on it. Good. All sorts of physical facts would change, right? There would have been pressure on that seat in a way that there isn't now, and so that would have changed. Um, Presumably, they would have exerted gravitational force on the rest of us, um, greater than what they're doing right now when they're not here. Um, it's tiny. Nobody would observe it. Uh, oh, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> an example. Okay. So somebody enters. Now he's here. That fact has changed. What other facts are going to change? No pressure. <laughs> What about that? I, yeah, I put him up to this. That would have been awesome. But I didn't actually think to do that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the course of discussion will change if that, well, I guess it's not a fact that that person will talk, though. Wow. No, good, right? It depends. What Does that person say anything? I'll probably say something. <laughs> See, he, uh, probably he just did, okay? So he said something. If he hadn't been here, he wouldn't have said that. So that's already changed things. That changed what I just said. And so there might be all sorts of facts changed as a result of that due to his causal interaction with the rest of us. And so that, too, is going to change facts. Now, what does Wittgenstein mean, then, when he says each item can be the case or not be the case while everything else remains the same? It means a lot of those facts are really derivative, right? They're derivative facts. These basic facts 
are going to be ones that are totally, well, at least logically independent. Now, he doesn't say they're causally independent. And so maybe we've been picking out causal dependencies. Um, it is true that, gosh, everything else wouldn't have remained the same. So at least it appears that that kind of thing is involved. Maybe, are they, is he saying they're causally independent too? That seems strange. But if they're at least logically independent, then we're going to have to exclude lots of facts. Presumably the fact that now there's someone sitting behind you and in front of you and uh, to the left of you and to the right of you and so on. All of those presumably are not atomic facts because they've been changed by someone's presence. The fact, a basic fact changed and then all sorts of other facts changed derivatively. Let's go on to proposition two. What is the case? A fact is the existence of states of affairs. So a fact is something that is the existence of a state of affairs. Now this is important, but also potentially confusing. States of affairs can exist or not exist. So right now, for example, there is an empty cat carrier in my office. Okay, uh, yeah, don't ask. Um, but a state of affairs then of the cat carrier being in my office and the cat carrier being empty, those states of affairs exist. Now at two o'clock, a student from last semester is bringing me a cat. <laughs> this happens to me a lot. I, I really should stop teaching so that students stop bringing me cats. <laughs> but anyway, this cat is arriving at 2 o'clock. That will change the state of, states of affairs, right? There will still be a cat carrier in my office, but then there will be a cat in it. And so, and then I will take the cat home. I'm not going to just leave it there. <laughs> so that will lead to the departure of both cat and cat carrier. So what about that state of affairs of the cat carrier being empty? It exists now. It will stop existing around 2 o'clock. Okay? And a new state of affairs will start existing, the cat in the cat carrier. But states of affairs are things like that. They are objects standing in relation to one another, or being, uh, or exhibiting a certain quality. And those things can exist or not exist. Now what do we say about the fact? The fact is the existence of the state of affairs. It's a fact right now that there is an empty cat carrier in the office. And so that fact is a fact because the state of affairs of the cat carrier, empty being in the office, exists. Um, it's nice to have a language that will allow us to talk about the fact. What happens to the fact of the empty cat carrier at 2 o'clock? Well, the state of affairs ceases to exist. What do we say about the fact? It's no longer a fact. It's nice to have some language for that. And so the language people often use is that the fact obtains or fail to, fails to obtain. <laughs> Um, but that can be a little tricky. Uh, basically, the fact obtains if and only if the state of affairs corresponding to the fact exists. Um, that's what constitutes the fact, the existence of that state of affairs. So you might think, I don't want to be too misleading here, um, but one way to think about it is that a state of affairs is the kind of thing that is sort of a possible fact. It might exist, in which case it is a fact. Or it might not exist, in which case it's just a possible fact. Yeah. So what is a fact about the cat carrier if it, I mean, if we're saying that it can change, like if you add a cat to the cat carrier, the fact that the cat character, the cat character, that the cat carrier is empty is no longer a fact, right? Right. So, like, what would be just a basic fact about the, fact, about the cat carrier? That it's just a cat carrier? All right, good. It's a really hard thing to identify the basic facts. And in fact, in fact, all the way through the Tractatus, we're going to get this diagram, as it were, of how the molecular uh, facts depend on atomic facts, and how, in short, these other constituents of the world depend on the ultimate constituents of the world. But then the question arises, well, great, you've given us this map of how to get down to the atoms, but what are the atoms? What are the basic facts, and what are the things in the basic facts? And guess the answer. You know, Russell at the end gets to this point and he says, oh, and I think they're the ultimate constituents of experience, so they're the sense data. Wittgenstein never tells us. And so 
there are two ways of thinking about that. One is he gets us up to the point where he says, okay, so it all depends on the ultimate constituents. What are they? I don't know, so I'm not telling you. Uh, <laughs> that's one way to read it. The other way is to say, here's what language does. It creates this structure. And then you say, what is it the ultimate, ultimately the structure of? He says, language can't answer that question. Maybe that's one of the things at the end that we have to pass over in silence. That's something we can't communicate. Later postmodernists actually say things that are very similar to that interpretation of Wittgenstein, that in the end, all language can do is divide up reality, carve it up into the basic facts. But if you say, now, what are the components of that? There's no way of answering that question. We've got language, and then, in the, intuitively speaking, what the language is the language of, and a postmodernist might say, there's no way to talk about that. Because we'd have to use language, we can never get outside language to say what it's actually giving us a picture of. And I think there's a lot in Wittgenstein that gives support to that sort of picture. Yeah? I don't know if this is the same kind of idea, but I had, I had a really hard time, like a year ago, I had a seven-year-old cousin at the time visiting, and she, in and she pointed to the UD Tower and said, so that's University of Texas. And I said, yeah, that's the University of Texas. And then we were walking around campus and she pointed to it and she said, but is that U University of Texas too? And I said, well, yeah, that's also the University of Texas. And I started to think about like, well, if I remove one building, is it still the university? I, I had a really hard, I, did, I didn't think I had the language to describe how all of the things were the University of Texas. And yet if you remove one thing, it might still be the University of Texas. And if you removed another thing, it might still be. But at one point, is there really not a University of Texas? There's just this thing we call the map or something. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. Oh, yes, yes. OK, good. Yeah, somehow an ad campaign pops into my mind here. You, know? you look at the main building. This is UT. You look at this classroom. This is UT. Right. You look at you. This is UT, etc. Right? And that'd be kind of cool. Wow. I I should be an advertiser. <laughs> but, but no, there's an important philosophical question here. When you think about these large-scale facts, for example, facts about the University of Texas, you start thinking, wait a minute, how does that depend on whatever these atomic facts are? It's really complicated. And it's not at all obvious what that ends up meaning about the relationship to atomic facts. Um, there is a Buddhist text that actually gets at the same question. Um, where a monk, Nagasena, runs into the king. Uh, the king is driving in a chariot, and they begin to talk. And it's very funny, actually, because he says, who am I addressing here? He says, well, I'm, I'm called Nagasena, but that's just an appellation, a name, a way of counting. Really, there is no ego here to be found. And, and the king is astounded, starts asking him about this. And what, it, what he does is essentially give that kind of argument, precisely. Look, I'd still be me if I, yes, uh, is this hand, Nagasena? Well, you know, I'd still be me without the hand, so obviously not. It, I, I can't identify with me, me with a part, but you also can't identify me as the whole of consisting of these parts, because I could lose a part, right? So the main building could collapse or could be, uh, you know, torn down and replaced with something else, and it would still be the University of Texas. So, actually, he ends up going through a long list of things and concludes, yeah, none of those are essential to being me, so there is no Nagasena. Yeah. So I can imagine, if that you were a Buddhist, you would have continued saying, there is actually no University of Texas. <laughs> that was what I was, I was thinking, like, that can't be true that there's no University of Texas. That's what I, right. I didn't have No, of course not. So, so in the end, what it amounts to is that's, well, in, in Russell's terms, something like a complex of all these individual things. But it's hugely difficult to explain exactly what kind of complex it is. And I think as soon as you get into these counterfactual things, but wait, it would still be the University of Texas even if that didn't exist, or even if some of you hadn't come here, and so on and so forth. All of that makes you think, I don't actually know in the end what that is. Right. Yeah. Is the existence of states of affairs a place where Wittgenstein and Russell differ? Since wouldn't Russell say, like, the cat carrier's presence in your office is a complex, and therefore doesn't, it's a fiction, right? It doesn't exist in the way a symbol does? Oh, good. Notice I said the cat carrier. It doesn't have a name. Um, I have a friend who names almost everything. Uh, names his cars, names this and that, but the cap carrier has no name. Even my cars don't have names. So. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, 
Yeah, so that's a description, first of all. But even if it were a name, it would really resolve into some kind of description. So in the end, the cat carrier is nothing. It's no simple in Russell's view. It's so complex. You're absolutely right. Um, and Russell doesn't introduce something like a state of affairs. Here we've got a fact. And the fact is the existence of the state of affairs. So we've got a fact, maybe something like what? Um, that the carrier is empty. And corresponding to that is a state of affairs, um, which I will depict in the following way, using my brilliant artistic skill. <laughs> Well, anyway, and there's the, and see, no cat. There's no cat. In. Later, there will be a cat. So this is at, you know, uh, 11 o'clock. But now, at, say, 2.30, there will be cat carrier. And inside will be a cat. And so what will happen? That will be a different state of affairs, and this will cease to be. <laughs> so right now, this state of affairs exists, which makes that a fact. This one does not exist, but at 2.30, this one will exist. And this one will cease to exist. And at that point, there will be another fact. So this fact, that the character of something will no longer obtain. Yeah. Is that why Russell said that most atomic facts operate in like a short amount of time because state of affairs are usually changing? Um, well, it's partly that and partly the fact that the kind of uh, thing that he takes as basic is the kind of thing that constantly changes. Um, if you have in mind what the sensations you're receiving right now, mm -hmm. then wow, they keep changing every time you turn your eyes, anything moves in your visual field, anytime anything happens that... Uh, that you hear and so forth. And so if you think, ah, the pattern of sense data, the only way you can really get that to stay very stable is to just stare at the same thing that's not moving. Um, which is part of the reason, by the way, when people meditate, they tend to stare at something and just, it's like, just stare at the wall. Be the wall. And they're doing that to remove that, that source of change. Yeah. But Russell also believes that facts ultimately exist. We just can't talk about them, right? They they make a proposition true or false, but right. they are included in his ultimate constituents, facts. Facts. Uh, I wouldn't think they're constituents. I just think it would be like the most simple complexes, I guess. Yeah, it's. I actually don't know how to talk about that for Russell, but I, I my I, my inclination is more to think of it your way, which is that. For, I mean, he thinks he's giving you the same view as Wittgenstein. So I think, on one level, Russell thinks he's giving you a view where the facts are ultimate constituents. And yet, when you actually find out that, for example, their sense data, is a sense datum a fact? Um, what's the relationship between the sense datum, let's say, as I stare at the white chalk, and then some fact? I, I think, at least in the lectures uh, that we looked at, the philosophy of logical atomism, there's not really a very clear answer to that. Um, and it's one of those questions on which I think he changes his mind over time. Um, so whether facts are playing the same role in Russell that they are here, I'm not sure. I don't think there's enough evidence in a way in that uh, text to really be certain of that. Yeah, just regarding existence, the cat carrier couldn't exist for Russell because it's complex. It's not simple, right? Yeah, the carrier is, a, is some kind of complex, and so it's not fiction. Um, so it's certainly not an ultimate constituent of the world. It's actually strange to say it's fiction. I mean, that, if I said, <laughs> yeah, you know, there's a f this fiction that there's a cat carrier in my office, uh, that's not like, well, okay, if the cat carrier is fictional, where are you going to put the cat? Don't worry, the cat's fictional too. It's a complex. <laughs> uh, but that, that, that feels really strange, right? I mean, obviously, the cat and the cat carrier are not just things I'm making up. It's not them just telling you a story. There really is a cat carrier in my office. Yeah, I'm kind of confused on how fictions can't be symbols as well, because we can like I think we can kind of observe like there being two of something, yet two itself yeah. is a fiction. Two is a fiction, right? But there can be two of something. Mm -hmm. and yeah, we can still like and we can still see it with our sense data, right? Or like interpret with our sense data. 
Right, right. Yeah. So why do you think that's a problem? Because, and because you know, following that reason, I would think two could still be a simple, even though it's a fiction. Ah, well, yeah. Um, I think I think what it amounts to is Russell is using the term fiction in a sort of technical sense, mm -hmm. because you might think, look, um, if I ask you, a what is fiction? How would you answer that question? Now you're afraid to say anything. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I, what, what I, what I, you what I mean, thought was just um, the things that you would count and say these are two holes are always fictions. Like any complex hole that can be counted has to be a fiction itself. Might be one way to solve that. Like you can't count sense data, even though the term makes it seem like they are discrete things. I, don't think. I mean, can't you just like sense there being a pair of things though? Or like, it, does it have to like involve some kind of like action like, thought process, which turns it into like a fiction? I just thought you could like immediately interpret there being more than one like apple, say. Yeah. Sure. Well, I was just kind of going to go back to what I was saying earlier, and I definitely interpreted Russell that he believes that you know that facts exist on are are the basic constituents. Are like you on page thirty three? It says. He's talking about simples, and then he says, the only other sort of object you come across in the world is what we call facts. Ah, oh, okay, and right. So, like, I I guess how I interpreted it is a lot, um, I guess, a lot more similar to what Richmond Sign is saying here. And I don't really understand the difference if, if I'm right in saying that Russell believes that there are facts out there. But, no, you may be right. As I said, I'm, I don't think, here's why I don't think it's entirely settled. Because in the end, he says, well, what we're really after are these ultimate constituents of the world. Um, logical atomism is the view that you can get down in, to symbols that have a kind of being that nothing else has. And are facts included among that? In, in that passage, it sounds like he's saying, okay, here are the basic things, these symbols, and then also facts. And, like, our... That confuses me, since in the end I think he's sort of saying, ah, it's the views we can get down to the symbols, which are the real things. Well, what are the facts? And I don't think in Lecture 8, it's, it's like the facts have sort of disappeared. I don't know what status they have. And that's why I thought it was indeterminate. I agree with you there. It sounds like you've got two things. These things I'm going to count as symbols, and then you've got the facts that are composed of those. And I think that's a viable interpretation of what he's doing. It's just strange that by lecture eight, he seems to have forgotten about the facts. So I don't quite know what to say about that. So I think what you're saying is perfectly plausible. And on that reading, Russell's right that actually he's giving you an account very much like the kid signs. And really what we have here is a picture of, okay, symbols. And then there are simple atomic facts that are made up of those symbols. And those are the ultimate constituents of the world. Um, there, basically, for both Russell and Wittgenstein, there's this this sort of funny thing going on, because you've got facts that they are in some sense taking as basic, and yet, to put in this language, a fact is the existence of a state of affairs, and the state of affairs is going to be made up of objects. And so when we get down to the ultimate facts, these are going to be made up of symbols, and then we say, well, uh, so isn't a fact a complex of symbols? <laughs> and so does not fact not really exist? It's really the symbols? And I don't know how either one really means to answer that question. Because uh, a fact has to correspond to a simple, right? Well, a fact doesn't correspond to a simple. It has symbols as something like, it's, uh, well, at least an atomic fact would have something like uh, symbols as its constituents or components yeah. or something like that. So you yeah. can't have a fact without the symbols. But you could have right. simple. Well, I, I mean, it, you couldn't. I was going to say you couldn't have symbols without yeah, you, well, you can't really have a simple without a fact. What would that be like? Right? It would be something that exists but has no qualities, stands yeah, in no relation. Exactly, that's how yeah. Right. Well, anyway, I promised that we weren't going to get bogged down on just one page, and so far we're still on one page. And so I, I'm not pulling this Philip Reef thing that I actually sort of hate so much. So let me um, move us along quickly. To really know an object, I have to know all of its po possible occurrences in states of affairs and all kinds of states of affairs. Um, but now, I'm going to jump through a lot of the explanation of two, which I think gets immensely complicated and tricky, and get down to, well, 2.1. <laughs> mm. 
We picture facts to ourselves. Now that's important. We picture facts to ourselves. A picture is a model of reality. And so a picture is itself a fact, but the fact that the elements of a picture are related to one another in a determinate way represents the things that are related to one another in the same way. Notice what I've done in trying to draw this state of affairs. I've given you a little picture, right? I've drawn a little cat carrier. Here, I've drawn a cat inside the cat carrier. And the idea is that these are pictures. So, well, what does it mean to be a picture? It stands in a relation to a certain state of affairs. And so, here I've just drawn you a picture. But the idea is, well, look, this carrier really does correspond to something in the world. And so, here I've drawn it on the blackboard, but here you might say, is, now what am I going to do? I'm going to draw you another picture. But let's say this is my office, Wagoner 403, and here is, well, there's all sorts of stuff in my office, and as you know, it's a terrible mess if you've been there. And here's a stereo speaker, and on top of that stereo speaker is the cat carrier. And so, the idea is, look, this picture actually stands for something. In this case, it's not a picture of what's going on, because I've drawn a cat here. Here it's empty, so that sort of matches this. But later, there will be a cat in the cat carrier, and that will correspond to something, too. And so a picture is a kind of fact. It's a bunch of objects related to one another. And it stands for some other fact. It's representing some other fact. It's laid against reality like a measure, he says. So a picture includes a pictorial relationship. It has to have something in common with what it depicts. Now, this little picture of a cat doesn't have a lot in common with a cat, but it has something in common with a cat, right? What does it have in common with a cat? Say it again. What does this little drawing of cat have in common with an actual cat? It is in the shape of a cat. Okay, it has a, I mean, it has this, there's this head, right, and ears, <laughs> and whiskers. You said it was a cat. I said it was a cat, that's true. <laughs> yeah. And so fitting into a certain network in a way is, I said it was a cat. If I just, if, you know, I hadn't said a word and just looked, showed you that, said, what is that? I think it's a fish. It's a fish. It's like a platypus. Platypus? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, you know, I was trained in abstract art. Actually, you know what ruined me? Actually, I, I nothing ruined me. I always suck as an artist. <laughs> okay, somehow I took courses in painting and drawing and sculpture and got A's. But I have no idea how I got A's for those courses, because I, I really sort of stink. Um, <laughs> Surprise, surprise, right? Um, but I did have one drawing teacher who was convinced that the faster you drew something, the better it was, the more artistic it was. Now, this seems to me insane as a principle, but it made it easy to get an A, an a in his class because, ah, oh, there's the model. So you say, oh, okay, yes, here she is. So there's her hair. There! <laughs> oh, I love the abstraction. I can see the influence of cubism. <laughs> so, anyway, yeah. Um, now, what was I talking about? <laughs> what does this have? Well, yeah, the idea is the parts map onto things in reality. And so, there is a kind of relationship here that we can think of as a mapping relationship, um, as a function, as a correspondence. But there's some way of saying, ah, that corresponds to an ear, so is that. That corresponds to a whisker, that corresponds to a tail. That corresponds to a body. These little lines that look like insect legs, that corresponds to the cat's legs, and so on. Yeah. There's, there are some parts of the cat that, like, its correspondence to the drawing, or I mean, there's some parts of the drawing that its correspondence to the cat will be more important than others, like in the way we classify fruit, or so, like something, you know, some weird things classify as fruit because it was grown with a seed or something, even though it has no other relation to, to uh, fruit. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, yes. could you pick one thing out in that drawing that connects that to a cat more than anything else? Good. Ah, well, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> now that you said the fish thing, it is looking more and more like a fish to me. Uh, although the ears, I mean, the fish don't have ears like that. But, but you're right to say, and the tail looks platypus like now. I'm seeing yeah. why you saw it that way. <laughs> um, but notice what's happening here. When I was drawing it, I was thinking of certain features of a cat and representing them here. And so what was going on was 
Yes, first of all, I was is isolating certain features and emphasizing them in what I was doing. And the point here is that we're getting a picture theory of language. That's what language does, too. Language is something like a picture of reality. It's a map of reality, and there are certain features singled out by language. There's always much more complication in the actual object than can be represented in the drawing or in language. And so it's sort of like a partial model. That's why he says this is something like a model of reality. A model where all sorts of aspects of the real thing are being left out, but we're modeling certain aspects of it. Yeah. Um, would it be a one-to-one -one function, or would it... Because I was thinking that if you just draw a cat, you can make that as like a general like kind of picture for all cats. Ah, right. So, yes, it's uh, in general not going to be one-to-one. -one. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, <laughs> this inspires uh, a sort of model of truth that you get in something like uh, discourse representation theory, where this is understood as a homomorphic embedding. There's a homomorphism here, which allows for the fact that um, there isn't really a, an isomorphism, a one-to-one -one correspondence. You might say, this is isomorphic to certain features over there, certain things. But nevertheless, there might be many ways of mapping this into reality. So this, the cat that's arriving, in my office at two is named Bell. But actually, insofar as I've drawn this, that could be a representation of pretty much any cat. Right? I mean, uh, this is a very generic sort of <laughs> cat image. And language is like that, too. If I say, ah, the students are in the room, or even better, there are students in the room, that's something that could represent many, many different possible states of affairs. And so it, it is something that actually maps on to this reality in a certain way, but it would map on to many different realities, and that's typical for a language. Um, now, I have one minute to give you the big crowd. Yes, a logical picture of facts is a thought. So this is sort of a, a picture in a more obvious sense, but a thought is a picture of a fact, um, or a set of facts. Moreover, well, that's what a proposition is. It's really giving you that kind of picture. And, he says a proposition has one and only one complete analysis. Sentences might be ambiguous. Propositions are never ambiguous. And now, let's go to four. A ah, thought is a proposition with a sense. So we have propositions and senses of propositions. That's what thoughts are, really. And then he gives you a structure of truth and falsehood and how that all works. But now I want to jump ahead past a lot of the logical technicalities of this to where this is all ultimately going. Most of the book is actually an elaboration of Proposition 4. But finally we get 5. A proposition is a truth function of elementary propositions. So we can break propositions down into a structure. And that's reflecting a structure in the underlying facts. But then we get to the final, uh, you might say, <laughs> conclusion of all this. Proposition 6 and 7. So 6. The general, well, the general form of a truth function is blah, blah, blah. And what it really amounts to is something like a state of affairs and then a sign that tells you whether it obtained, uh, whether it exists or does not exist. That's the general form of a proposition. And that allows us to say certain things. But there are lots of things we can't say. There are lots of uses of language that aren't just depicting reality, even though that's what we do much of the time. And so, in the end, he says... What we cannot speak about, we must pass over in silence. We cannot answer all sorts of questions. Basically, he's saying this is what a scientific picture of the world is. It's something like a picture of the facts in the world, but there are all sorts of questions, like ethical questions, that we cannot ask in that framework. And he says, even when possible, all possible scientific questions have been answered, the problems of life remain completely untouched. Of course, there's then no questions left. And this is itself the answer. One of the things that can't be expressed is actually the relationship between thought and reality. And so in the end, the propositions of this book can't really be expressed either. And so he says, this is a ladder. And once you've climbed up the ladder, you realize you don't need the ladder anymore. And in fact, the ladder doesn't even make any sense. So you kick it away. This was all a way of getting you to the point to realize that none of the propositions in this book actually describe reality or pictures of reality, and so none of them actually 
make any sense? But the answer is, there is no question. 